and now it's really yours. Thank you, Wojtek. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation and to all of you for, uh, for being here. So yeah, um, I'll be talking about algorithms for quantizing neural networks and the title really should also say with theoretical guarantees that, that they work because there are plenty of algorithms out there that practitioners have come up with and they seem to work pretty well in practice, but they don't come with, um, with performance guarantees. And we're gonna show some algorithms that also work pretty well in practice, but also come with uh, performance guarantees. So, ah, so we can't click. Um, now we can click. Okay, so this is joint work with uh, a few very talented people. Eric, who is in the audience, uh, my PhD student Jinji Jang, and a very talented undergrad at UCSD, Ishwan Zhou, and a uh, collaborator in Germany, uh, Johannes Mali. So I'll be talking about three kind of algorithms, uh, each with its own pros and cons and uh, its own theoretical guarantees. This is supported by the NSF and the Simons Foundation. Great, so I, I don't really need to convince you that neural nets and machi large machine learning models are all the rage because they're very successful these days, but I wanna focus on um, one important property that they seem to be having and increasingly so as time passes. So first they're getting better. So as time uh, moves forward, their accuracy at doing certain tasks, in this case, it's classifying on ImageNet, gets better and better. At the same time, it gets better and better that a kind of slower than at a concave rate, right? So the increment over time is getting smaller and smaller, but their sizes seem to be increasing. So when uh, Eric defended his PhD about a year and a half ago, this column showed the state of the art and the number of parameters for the state of the art. And it said something like 400 or 500 million. Now it says 2,100 million. So that's 2 billion parameters in this function that is getting you 90 something percent accuracy. If you look at this column, you'll see how many flops or giga flops are needed to actually run this network on like one image. And that's something like 2,586 gigaflops to run one inference task. So they're very successful, but they're very expensive. Uh, and this is image images. So if you wanted to do natural language processing, then you're talking, you know, as of 2021, 530 billion parameters for state-of-the-art stuff. So it's a function with 530 billion parameters. Great. So, you know, the natural question is, can we reduce? Can we make this a little bit smaller? Uh, and our approach is gonna be not to touch the training. So, you know, Google can do its thing, Facebook can do their thing, they can train their favorite network. And what we're gonna try to do is take the network that they have already trained and try to make something smaller that does the same task. That way we avoid the approximation theoretic questions associated with neural networks that we haven't yet figured out how to deal with. Okay, so motivating questions. Is this even doable? Does there exist in a quantized neural network? One where I replace these real numbers, these 530 billion numbers by things that are much simpler, maybe 530 billion plus or minus ones instead, because multiplying by one or negative one or zero, if I'm lucky, is way easier than multiplying by a 32 bit float or a 64 bit float. Uh, can I force many of these 530 billion parameters to be zero. So can I enforce things like sparsity? In other words, get rid of some of these parameters. And if I can do these tasks, can I do them in a reasonable amount of time? I don't want very expensive algorithms that scale in horrible ways with dimension. I have 530 billion things. If I'm talking about you know, polynomial algorithms or exponential algorithms, that's high cost. And of course, can we get theory to go with that? So here's some uh, setup. Uh, the setup is basically, I have something like a feed-forward network. It has L layers. It's a, it's a basically linear or affine layer followed by nonlinear, followed by linear, followed by nonlinear, and on and on, uh, where each one of these things is acting component-wise in the standard way. As an example, you have the ReLU function. And our dimensions, just to uh, put some names on things, are NL by NL plus one. So basically, you take... Uh, at the zeroth layer, something in dimension n0, and then you output something in dimension n1, which goes to the next layer and on and on. So this is the picture that you usually see. And uh, you usually have some bias. These things are affine, but we'll not worry 
too much about the bias. And the reason we won't worry about the bias is because you can always embed things in a one dimension higher space and then work with one row extra in your weight matrix and then not worry about this thing and just think about linear objects. So the goal for now is to replace these WLs, the weight matrices, by QLs in such a way that the performance of the network is uh, preserved. So what does that mean? Uh, what this means is going to be driven by data. So we're going to say, I'm going to hand you a bunch of data, and I want you to find me a network that matches the performance of the original one on the data that I hand you. So that means we need a matrix of data. In this case, I have M data points. They are in N zero dimensions. And uh, we want the, the network to, to perform well on it. So I assume that Google or Facebook or whatever hands me their giant network that acts on the data and does the task that it's supposed to do. So I'm handed an already trained network. I'm handed some quantization alphabet, like for simplicity, I'm gonna call this negative one, zero, and one. So I want to replace each real number by a negative one, a zero, or a one. And I'm handed uh, a performance metric. In this case, I'm thinking of the L2 norm squared. Uh, and I want to do it, our approach to this, this is not the only way you can do it, but it seems like a good approach to think about uh, when you first tackle this problem. You're, maybe it's a good idea to say, I want the new network to match the old network at the first layer. And then I want it to match it at the second layer. And then I want to match it at the third layer and on and on. And this way, maybe you get some control as you propagate the adder through the network. Or maybe you can correct the adder as you, as you move forward. So we want to minimize this L2 error for Benius norm squared uh, for every layer. That means that we can focus at least the start on the first layer. So at the first layer, I have weights acting on data, and I want quantized weights to act on the data, give me the same thing. Now, of course, there's a nonlinearity, but these nonlinearities are often Lipschitz, and so that's not too big of a deal. If I can control this term, I can control it through the Lipschitz constant. Okay, so let's simplify a little more. Frobenius norms are basically norms on matrices. My matrices are made up of columns. So I've got quantized column minus original column. So this is a neuron. Each one of these columns is a neuron. I'm quantizing each one of them separately. So basically it's a Frobenius norm. So I have a sum of column norms squared. So essentially I can not not I don't have to worry about minimizing each one of them individually because they're identical problems. It's separable. So minimizing the sum means just minimizing each sum man. And life is good in that sense. So I can parallelize, though I'm not going to worry about parallelization. OK. This is all to say that we can reduce mathematically the problem that we're thinking of to the problem of minimizing this type of object. In other words, I want to find a Q that lives in my alphabet cross itself n times, so negative one, one to the n, so that xw minus xq is as small as possible. Now, this is a, there are two questions that come up, right? The first one is, if I do this, is this even guaranteed to be small? And the second one is, can I do this? So this we'll skip over, but the answer will be yes, because we're gonna prove that we can do it. And, is it guaranteed uh, and is it doable? Well, if you wanted to actually do an arg min, this is an NP hard problem. It's an integer programming uh, problem. And in general, you're not gonna be able to find the minimizer without going through all the corners of the cube. So, so in, in principle, this looks terrible, but maybe we can do something anyway. So our first approach, which is gonna be, which is gonna have the advantage of simplicity at the cost of computation. So we're going to be able to easily understand this approach and easily understand how it, how it behaves. And it's based on a pretty nice geometric lemma. So the nice geometric lemma says the following. If I have a matrix that's fat, m by n, and it's in general position, so all its submatrices are invertible, and I, def and I have a linear system, b equals az, kind of like something equals xw. I have my nice linear system, and I solve this L infinity minimization problem. Find me the vector that has smallest infinity norm that matches the data. Then it has a pretty interesting property that most of its uh, coefficients are going to be plus or minus the infinity norm. 
So the geometric interpretation of this is pretty simple. It's basically that uh, if you're minimizing an infinity norm, then you're blowing up an infinity ball until it hits a linear constraint, B equals AZ. And so it's gonna hit at some point that's essentially on the exterior of the cube. It won't be a corner in general, but it won't be too far from a corner if my dimensions are right. So in particular, the cardinality of the points that achieve the, the coefficients that achieve the infinity norm is gonna be N minus M plus one. So in the over-parameterized regime, when I have lots of uh, parameters and few data, uh, this number is very close to n. So why is this useful? Because it suggests a really simple approach to quantizing this stuff. It basically says, I want to match xw. So xw is going to be my b. And I want to solve for some q. So I'm going to call these things z. And effectively, just find the thing that has the smallest L infinity norm. And that will have most of its coefficients already quantized for you to negative C and C, right? What is this constant? It's the infinity norm itself, wherever this ball hits the, 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 the linear constraint. And that basically means that you, you, you have no error if you quantize this way, except that you have M things that are still unquantized. So you go and you quantize them using your favorite approach, but because there are so few of them, you can control the error easily. Because M is much smaller than N in the over-parameterized region. You have 530 billion parameters. So the theorem that comes out of this, if you then just put some model assumptions on the data, let's say that the data is Gaussian or random but nice, where you can make this precise, then, uh, what you can show is that the relative error, so the norm of the quantized uh, neuron acting on the data divided by the original object is going to scale like square root m log n over the ratio of the infinity norm of the weights to the two norm of the weights. If the weights are well behaved, meaning infinity norm and two norm are far apart from each other, then this is going to give you a decay like square root m over n. So that means that as your network is more over-parameterized, your error is gonna be smaller and smaller. And that filters down even to the quantization stuff. So that's like the first approach. And it's a very simple idea with a nice uh, proof. I essentially just proved it for you on, on one slide. Uh, its pros are that if you increase the size of the alphabet, you decrease the error like two to the negative uh, number of bits. You also increase uh, the perform or decrease the error as n goes to infinity. The proof is elementary, that's nice, but the computational complexity is the complexity of solving an infinity norm optimization problem. That's a linear program, so it's polynomial up to if you solve it to a certain accuracy with interior point methods or something. And it's difficult to go to multiple layers uh, because this theorem will still hold, um, um, this theorem will still hold. The problem is that it becomes harder to figure out what the distribution of X is after it gets fed through linear and nonlinear uh, layers. So it's hard to know um, what to do probabilistically. Okay, so let's do something faster than, than that. Uh, we're going to now use a greedy approach. So we're going to look at xw minus xq, and we're going to notice it's just a sum. It's a weighted sum of the columns of x, where each weight is just the error in that one coefficient. And our strategy is going to be just be super greedy. So at each step, think of this sum as a partial sum and try to make the partial sum as close as possible uh, at step t. And then if you keep the partial sum very close, then by the time you reach n, you're still very close. And hopefully, even though you have n terms in your sum, your error will not have an n or will have a weak dependence on n. Okay, so the algorithm is this greedy path following algorithm. Uh, it's basically going to say, start with a running sum of the error. So this will be familiar to some of us. Start with a running sum of the error and then, uh, Minimize at every step, pick the best P, pick the best thing in your alphabet that minimizes uh, the cumulative error up to this point, that minimizes the running sum. 
So previous adder plus current adder. And then update the running sum of the adders. So writing it this way allows you to analyze it. And in particular, it allows you to notice that this argmin step on the previous slide, this one, has a nice analytic solution. And the nice analytic solution is scalar quantization of this quantity in here. So you're scalar quantizing, you're rounding to the nearest element of the alphabet, not the weight, which is the intuitive thing to do, but not a good thing to do, but rather the weight plus some term. And that term is essentially a projection of the previous error on the current vector. So how much is the error in the direction of the current vector? Uh, take that component, add it to the weight and, and quantize it. So it's, it's an error correction step. It's a noise cancellation step. And then update as before. So that's our greedy path following uh, algorithm. Let's count steps, count flops. So I basically have to solve this, uh, this problem, but it's easy because it's scalar. So it costs me just rounding, an, in, rounding a number and then an inner product, but each vector is in M dimensions. So that's M flops. And then a sum of M dimensional vectors, so M flops. How many steps do I have to do it? N steps, so it costs me MN. That's great. My data matrix was of size MN. So I, this is costing me a constant times reading the data. Okay, here's a theorem that uh, tells me how things behave. So this is general, and then we'll apply it to some distributions. So the theorem really tells you that you need your data to come from, or you want your data to come from a distribution where um, that has a nice property. The nice property is that take a vector from your distribution, look at the cosine squared of the angle with any vector in the space, you want the expected value to be bounded away from zero by some quantity. The reason you care about this cosine, loosely speaking, is because it shows up in some form here. So distributions that satisfy this are pretty much sub-Gaussians of, of all types. Um, and then if you have this nice property, then you can say something about the error. The further away you're bounded from zero, the better because the probability that your error is small becomes better and better. So let's uh, apply this to something and get something interpretable from it. Uh, we're going to apply it to, again, Gaussians, just to compare to the previous result. But again, this applies to lots and lots of distributions. So in particular, this tells you that if your data comes from some column normalized Gaussians, then the error behaves like m log n. So remember, I was worried that I'm summing n terms. I didn't want a strong dependence on n, and I just got a log n dependence on, on n, which is good. So even though you're accumulating n steps of error, you're only uh, paying log n uh, in, in, in the sum of squares business. Works for Bernoulli, works for Gaussian mixture models, which you might care about in the later stages of a neural network if you're doing classification. You might hope that your neural network is basically creating Gaussian clusters that are linearly separable. So you'd like to say something about those. And it also works if your data isn't uh, Gaussian, but rather comes from um, convolutional neural networks. So in other words, you, you take your image, you split it up into little blocks, and you, you, you put all these blocks into a matrix, and then that becomes a convolutional uh, neural network. OK. <clears throat> uh, some comments about this. Is this good? I mean, we have square root m log n. Does, is this a good error bound? Is that a bad error bound? Uh, turns out it's a good error bound because there's an unresolved conjecture that tells you that pretty much the Comloge conjecture that basically tells you that the best that you can hope for is an infinity norm error bounded by a constant c, which would imply that this is a c root m. And the best algorithms that are out there for the Comloge conjecture uh, get you like m log m or m log n. So we're, we're hitting pretty close to the limit uh, conjectured by, by Comloge, but uh, unlike the Comloge conjecture, we're not doing it for all matrices. We're doing it for matrices that come from nice distributions with a linear algorithm. Okay, so that's good news. Uh, some corollaries. This, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We saw this before with the more expensive algorithm. It's the same relative error bound that we get with this faster algorithm. So the relative error decays with the overparameterization as before. Uh, if it so happens that your data had some structure, maybe it came from a d-dimensional subspace, then the parameter that shows up in the numerator is not the size of the data, but the dimension of the subspace. 
which is nice because that basically tells you that if you had more and more data, your error isn't going to be larger. Your relative error isn't going to, it's the intrinsic dimension that matters. Uh, I mentioned that we would like a bunch of the coefficients to be zero, right? And so we're going to do a small adjustment to the algorithm. And our small adjustment is rather than quantize this, uh, the sum, we're going to quantize a soft thresholded version of the sum. So what's soft thresholding? Anything that is, there's a parameter lambda, anything whose absolute value is greater than lambda gets lambda subtracted off of it. And anything whose absolute value is between, uh, anything that is between negative lambda and lambda gets set to zero. So it's pushing things to zero. And then if zero is in your alphabet, you're going to quantize to zero. So this has the potential of sparsifying your weight matrix and setting a bunch of weights to zero. And the theorem basically tells you that it indeed does. So you can run through the more or less the same argument with this soft thresholding uh, operator and prove that the relative error behaves the same way. So square root m log n divided by the L2 norm of the weight matrix, which should scale with the size of the, of the, of the vector. So this should be a square root n at the bottom. And how does it depend on lambda? Well, it depends on lambda inside the squiggly term. It's a completely linear dependence. It's basically a lambda sitting here. So the more you want things to go to zero, you're going to pick a bigger lambda, and you're going to incur a linearly kind of increasing error. And we'll see in a second when we do the numerics that it actually does a very nice job. So the pros I've pretty much covered, uh, it's fast compared to the other one and it promotes sparsity. The cons are we still have a problem with the multiple layers because again, the distribution is gonna change as we feed through the network and that's gonna make the analysis hard. Um, the quick fix is, I won't go into details. We replace the rounding operator by a randomized rounding operator. So instead of, um, instead of, quantizing pi to three all the time, sometimes I'm gonna quantize it to four and I'm going to do it in a way that the expected value is pi. So most of the time it's gonna to go to three, sometimes it's gonna to go to four and the expectation is pi. And uh, that's it. You, you can prove some theorems about this, different proof techniques this time. This is good because now the randomness is in your control. It's in your hands. So you don't have to worry about what happens in future layers. It's not the data distribution that matters, it's the distribution of the error. You're controlling that through the stochastic quantization. So you can now get finer control on the error. You get an infinity norm rather than a two norm, which if you apply to the previous settings without worrying too much about that, it reproduces the same results with different constants. Uh, and it produces results for future layers where the error now depends on columns of the um, activations after a certain number of layers. So, so this gave us proofs for multiple uh, layer neural networks. Okay, some numerics to show that all this is not just pie in the sky stuff. This is uh, some neural network, Alex Nett, state of the art as of maybe eight, nine years ago, something like this, 60 million parameters only, but for us on computers, that's plenty. <laughs> Uh, what we see here is increasing batch size. So this is the size of the training data. And this is the accuracy on uh, test sets. Accuracy improves as you get more and more data. And uh, different colored lines are basically telling you how many bits you're using for the quantization. So if you use more bits, obviously you're gonna do better, but you do still pretty well with three bits. And, um, this shows you what happens if you try to sparsify. So I mentioned you can sparsify with the soft thresholding operator. And this is how the sparsity increases. So number of zeros or percentage of zeros as lambda increases. And you can see that it goes from 55% being zero to something like, uh, I'm sorry, from 10% being zero to something like 60% of the coefficients being zero. And how much do you lose in accuracy? This much, whatever it is, one or one and a half percent. Um, which, is, which is really good. Because if you think about it, what you've done is you've gotten rid of more than 60% of your coefficients and the remaining ones, which were 32 bits are now like four bits or three bits. 
So it's a massive reduction in how much it takes to store and in computation. So multiplication by zero is cheap. So same picture for other neural nets. This is the biggest one that we could handle, like 138 million um, parameters, same story, and lots of future work and open questions. Uh, we would like to handle multilayer quantization, maybe without the stochastic quantization, and uh, maybe weaken some randomness assumptions on the data, maybe put some manifold assumptions or union of manifold assumptions or low dimensional assumptions of other types. We'd like to take into account what people do in practice, which is they retrain after every layer. So see if that has any theoretical foundation or if it's just a good idea in practice uh, that could be circumvented in other ways. And uh, more pie in the sky, uh, maybe you don't want to preserve the architecture of the neural network. Right now, we're just stealing the neural network's architecture and just replacing the weights by better behaved weights. Maybe you can come up with a function from a different function class that acts very similarly. So that will tie in with some of the function approximation questions that Wei Lin and others have, have thought about. Uh, and then, of course, maybe you care about cross entropy or things like this rather than just L2 adders. So yeah, that's it. If you'd like to play with code, there's some code on these uh, uh, web pages. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for a great talk, ladies and gentlemen. Any questions, comments? I have to say, I'm curious, and and then it's an unfair question that that since you sort of alluded to the two peaks and you showed three, four, and five peaks. Is there ever any hope of, of, of using this, this, this really low number deep quantization and still get the performance that, that, So that. we tried, and I mean, it's much better than chance. So in other words, I mean, here you're looking at hundreds of classes and you're getting, you're getting accuracy in the 80%. If you, if you went down, if you look closely at this thing, you'll notice that the gap between the red and yellow is something, and then the yellow and green is a little bigger. So this is as you go from five to four to three. If you go down to two and one, you'll be like somewhere here or here. It's way, way better than chance, but not what you would like to be competitive. So I think to do that, you probably need to take into account more things than just uh, tracking one layer at a time, one neuron at a time, but, but I'm not sure. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? So just your, so your, uh, you mentioned at the beginning that when you get bias, you kind of keep the system by taking the one, right? Yeah. Right. But then, of course, you have that uh, stochastic assumption on the data, right? So the one, it doesn't exactly satisfy that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we didn't worry too much about the bias, even in the implementation. The reason being that it's uh, one parameter compared to the size of the whole uh Neuron. So in principle, you could MSQ it and not worry about it. Yeah. And uh, in physics, you know, eventually of the weight, eventually that turns into a scalar, right? So there's no, you have to clear all the data and then you do this. Yes, yes. So the, I think uh, there are probably two ways to do this. One is you just keep the scale because it's just one, one of them. Yeah. 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 And the other one is to say, I'm going to uh, pick the scale beforehand and freeze it. But I mean, what works better in practice is to find the best scale and then store it. Yeah. And, and maybe that's a good follow up again. So, if, if you were to now that you know that you want to quantize, what if you say you get quicker than you keep the things that you're saying and keep the layer in between? That's a great question. I mean, uh, we haven't figured out how to do that yet, but it's, it's something we're thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so can you say a little bit more about the um, the isotropy assumption in yeah the, in the results? So, so the 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 real thing is you want this property, right? So so what you want is a distribution where the expected value, as you look at, so U is a stand-in really for the state variable U that's keeping track of the error. And Z is a stand-in for your data point because this particular term is what shows up, like X in a product U. So all this is asking is that you can lower bound this term. Now, 
here I'm requesting that I can lower bound it for all vectors all the time, yada, yada. But in, in reality, what you might care about is just the things that are generated by your system. This thing could be time varying. You could have a finer analysis of, of that, but it, I mean, it gets messy. So that's, that's one reason to make an assumption that's more broad. Uh, yeah, so, sorry. And it, I mean, it works for things like Bernoulli and Gaussian. So. Interesting, so that we just comparing that's a good question so uh what i can what i can say is that when you apply uh the previous theorem and apply it to things like gaussian mixture models so you you have a couple of parameters to say what the mean is and what the variance is of each uh, and how many data points you have from that distribution and those three things show up in in in, in the theorem um so it is sensitive to that and obviously if they're small but i we haven't dug in detail into uh, what it looks like in practice. And the reason for that is, I mean, we're looking at these hundred layer, whatever, however many layer neural nets. And uh, we haven't like looked at where these Gaussian clusters are showing up and what is appearing and what isn't appearing. We, so, yeah. It's specific to classification. There's something between years, like, you know, you know, forget about like one of the smaller models, you know, the state of like, you know, compression the model. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's a sense of how well this is. So, how much is the quantitation now essentially also dependent on the thing itself? So, you're sort of doing like, uh, and, and, and Fritz there, I think, is a really good sort of question. So, if you have a different distribution, uh, a, a test time, obviously, this hurts normal performance, but hurt it more. Absolutely. With Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, I just want to be careful how I, how I, how I answer that okay. because, um, Effectively, what you're asking is a generalization type of type of result, and uh, it's one of the things that we were almost intentionally avoiding by uh, saying, "I don't want to assume anything about the network that I'm trying to quantize," because you know maybe it, maybe the original network has nice generalization bounds, maybe it doesn't. I, I I actually don't know what I can prove about ResNet or VGG or anything like this. So um, there are two components to the error. That, that you're thinking about, like the distribution shifts, it's possible that the original network also like becomes terrible. Uh, it's possible that the original network stays good and then the quantization performs uh, performs poorly. So we don't have that fine control yet. There are no other questions. Let me thank our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you.